Dear brothers and sisters, in every one of the scriptures of the past, you find this notion of false messiahs. False messiahs that come and go. Some of them are more advanced than others. Some of them have certain tools of deception or the circumstances allow for their deception to last longer than others. And sometimes as the tools advance, then the case becomes more convincing because every one of these false messiahs that has come makes a claim. And so if you are looking in Judaism, you have false messiah after false messiah after false messiah. And then there's the concept of the ultimate false messiah before obviously the ultimate messiah. And then on the other hand, you have messiahs who are like mujaddideen, people who revive until you have Al-Masih, the ultimate Messiah, who of course is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him. And so in our conception, as we look to this idea of Dajjal, and we talk about a Dajjal and what the Dajjal looks like, the Antichrist, the false Messiah looks like, there are a few things that I wanted to cover ta'ala for us today, more about the conditions in which a figure like that can rise and can take advantage of so many different people. Now over the last 200 years, or last 100 years in specific, the tools of deception have obviously increased. The quality of those tools and those mechanics have increased. And so, you know, when the TV first came out, some said, that's the Dajjal. It's your iPad. It is your phone. And then, no, you know, it was Facebook, and now it's Metaverse, and these are all Dajjal. And while there are certainly forms of Dajjala, certainly forms of deception that are enabled to these tools, and those tools, you know, as they develop, become more frightening, there is the Dajjal that we hear about from the Prophet ﷺ in numerous traditions, and there is a specific twist to this Dajjal, and that is that he is the ultimate deceiver. He has the ultimate optical illusions, is able to play with people's eyes and able to deceive them with his claims in ways that other people before him were not able to. So he is the culmination, if you will, of all of those tactics, while certainly the conditions prior to him make his arrival ripe. Now, before I go into the conditions in which Dajjal rises, I think it's very pertinent that we talk about the things that the Prophet ﷺ told us to protect ourselves from a Dajjal. Very briefly, number one, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Iman, faith. And specifically, faith before it's too late. To have faith before it's too late to profess and to have faith. There's a time when faith comes, or t there's a time when faith is no longer accepted. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Thalatha that there are three things. Once they come out, the Prophet ﷺ said that there is a time that comes once these three things arrive. At that point, if a person did not profess faith or they did not benefit from their faith. They did not benefit from their faith, meaning it was merely an expression, but not actually a heartfelt reality or something that was acted upon or practiced. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned the rising of the sun uh, from, the, from the west. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned a dajjal and he mentioned the dabba. So he mentioned these three things, the rising of the sun, the beast, and the antichrist. And that at that point, Iman does not benefit a person if it's sought to be initiated at that point. It's something that you have to do in advance. The second thing the Prophet ﷺ gave us was ilm, was knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ told us who this person is and what he looks like. He said وسلم, that no Nabi was sent, no Prophet was sent, except that he warned his people about Al-A'war Al-Kathab, about this one-eyed liar. And he said, he is one-eyed and your Lord is not. Your Lord is not one-eyed. And between his two eyes, on his forehead is written the word kafir. Okay? He is written as a disbeliever. Now this builds upon the previous one, which is faith. Why? Because faith is what inspires that proper knowledge. And that knowledge is not merely information, it is knowledge that you ascertain, that you affirm with everything that you have. 
So there is number one, faith before it's too late. Number two, knowledge of the Dajjal. Number three, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, taught us to make a dua at the end of every one of our prayers. Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that at the end of every one of your prayers, when you finish the tashahud, each one of you should seek refuge in Allah from four things. Say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhab al-qabr wa min fitnatil mahya wal mamat wa min sharri fitnatil masih al-dajjal. Again, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of jahannam. Wa min adhab al-qabr and from the punishment of the grave. Wa min fitnatil mahya wal mamat and from the trials of life and death. Wa min sharri fitnatil masih al-dajjal. The Prophet ﷺ said, memorize this and say it at the end of every prayer before your taslim. Now, of course, if you don't pray, then you're not making the dua. <laughs> so it all builds on it, right? Faith, knowledge of who Dajjal is, the faith and knowledge of how to pray, and then the prayer that you do on a daily basis. And the dua that you make in every single one of these prayers, you learn this dua, you memorize it, and you say it every time. Number four, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever memorizes 10 verses from the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, he said, Usima min al-Dajjal, he will be immune from the fitna, from the trial and tribulation of the false messiah. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. And it's very powerful because if you think about the people of the cave, the sleepers of the cave, they were people, young people, that left the allure of this world and left the deception of this world. They sought, they sought to flee from fitna, to, to flee from that deception and to protect their faith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them a miracle in which He allowed them to sleep through that fitna for hundreds of years, right? And He made an example out of them, a positive example out of them subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever memorizes, keeps these 10 verses, the first 10 and the last 10 of Surah Al-Kahf, then they will be protected from a dajjal Number five, the Prophet ﷺ taught us to flee from fitna, flee from tribulation. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let he who hears of the Dajjal go far away from him, for I swear by Allah that a man will come to him thinking that he is a believer. He'll challenge him. And then he'll leave confused by the ideas and by the deception of Dajjal. So the Prophet ﷺ taught us in general, don't put yourself in bad situations. Don't put yourself in bad situations. This is, of course, a general principle of fleeing from fitna, to avoid places where your faith is likely to be compromised. Don't put yourself in bad environments. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Allah is not tasking you that if you hear about this person, that you go and you confront him. No, rather flee from this person. Flee from their deception. And of course, flee from the types of things that would be put out there by a Dajjal. So these are five things that we take from the Prophet ﷺ of how to protect ourselves from a Dajjal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that protection. Allahumma ameen. But here's what I want to go on to. Dajjal does not arrive in a vacuum. He does not come at a random time. There are things that precede him that are not just signs, but that make the environment for deception that much more fertile and make the hearts and the minds and the vision more susceptible to being deceived. And that's where this hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said from Anas ibn Malik anhu, and pay attention to the wording. You know, sometimes subhanAllah, we read through these things so fast and every word, you've got to pause and think. You know, I never thought about the way the Prophet ﷺ placed it here. He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna amam al-Dajjal, Sineen khadda'a, the Prophet ﷺ said, before Dajjal comes, there are years of deception. Before this false messiah comes, there are years of false messiahs and deceptive tactics. Years of false deception. Years of these things happening. Right? The world changes in a way that it sort of sets the ground. It sets the stage for a Dajjal. And what happens in those years of deception? The Prophet ﷺ said, يُكَذَّبُ فِيهَا sadiq That a truthful person is called a liar. وَيُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الْكَاذِبِ 
and the liar is considered to be truthful. Why? Because the liar is good at deceiving and covering his lie, whereas the truthful, and this is something very profound, a person who is truthful will not resort to deception to prove their trustworthiness. Right? And so what's going to happen? They're just going to have to take it on the chin. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. Because a kathib will do whatever it takes to portray sidq. Whereas a sadiq is comfortable, a truthful person is comfortable with just being a truthful person. Right? So that's what happens first. Then the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that, the, the, that the trustworthy people are discredited. People of amana are considered to be discredited. And those who are treacherous are trusted. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَيَتَكَلَّمُ فِيهَا الرُّوَيْبِضَ He said وسلم, that at that time the most disgraceful of people speak. Their voices are projected. So people can't distinguish truth from falsehood anymore. They can't distinguish trustworthy people from dishonest people anymore. And because of that, who's going to take the stage? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ was asked, who are they? SubhanAllah, the way he described them, he said, al fuwaisiq little fusak, little men, little men, SubhanAllah, little people, little wicked people. But at the same time, they speak about affairs, all types of affairs and all types of things they have no business talking about. And they cause all types of issues for people. This is what precedes a Dajjal. So this is what's important to understand here. The world prior to him is a world where realities are distorted. Realities are distorted. And people seek to create their own paradise on earth. Our sensibilities are lost and our fitrah is compromised. Our natural goodness and inclination is compromised. And so people operate in a day and age prior to a Dajjal in vanity and they can't see past their immediate surface level vision. And as people become shallower, the tools to distort shallow realities become more advanced. So people can't see beyond the movies and the graphics and the, and, and, and the tactics and that stuff right in front of them. They can't see beyond that. But at the same time, they trust it more. <laughs> and the, the tools by which you can distort all of that are becoming more advanced. And so you have the situation where if that shallow reality doesn't immediately satisfy me, and this is how it affects faith, then I deny it. So that's why you see people deny faith in the name of rationality. Now, not that Islam is not an intellectual faith. Islam is an intellectual faith. Use your senses, use your brain. But then people treat their senses as divine, even though those senses are being constantly compromised. And if I can't see it immediately in front of me, then I'm not going to believe in it. So, at the, you know, when people talk about faith and they talk about Jannah and they talk about Nar and they talk about Akhirah, the hereafter, and they talk about the unseen and all that stuff, I can't see it right in front of me. And even though I don't even know what I'm seeing anymore, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me because I can't see it right in front of me. And SubhanAllah, ironically, those who deny the existence of a Dajjal, you know, in the name of some enlightenment, those who deny the existence of a Dajjal in the name of no visual evidence, they're displaying the very weakness that makes them more likely to fall for his visual distortions. I can't see it, I don't believe it. Where is this Dajjal now? Oh really, Dajjal, sounds funny. You know? And so people that start to deny it, why? Because I can't find it now, I don't see it now. They trust their vision so much that they're most likely to fall victim to their vision when the actual Dajjal rises. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from his fitna. Allahumma ameen. Where do I want to get to with this inshaAllah ta'ala and what do I want us to really take home and think about? Dajjal himself, this false messiah, he knows he's an imposter. And he sees things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause him to see things that put him in his place. The Prophet sallallahu said, al Madina." يَأْتِيهَا الدَّجَّالِ فَيَجِدُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ when, when, when Dajjal comes to Medina, he would see the angels standing in front of al Medina, holding their armor, and he would not come anywhere near them. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a Dajjal sees Isa السلام, the actual Messiah, Jesus peace be upon him, when he sees Isa السلام, he literally starts to dissolve and run, melts and flees away from him because he knows he's an imposter. And he knows that his time has come. But there's something that I want to get to that is beyond that, which is 
you know, when Dajjal is presenting all of these different things to people, a virtual reality that you can step into, that will completely take you to where you want to go, right? He's presenting to you the dead. He cooperates with the shayateen so that the shayateen would take the image, would take the vision of a person who has passed away that believes in him and that affirms him. And he's creating all of this, all of this deception. There's something very specific that I want to get to and that is when Dajjal actually presents his Jannah. This is something, subhanAllah, that just caught me and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. When Dajjal presents his Jannah and says, enter into my Jannah, go ahead and enter into my paradise. And there's something of his magic, subhanAllah, and these, these tricks and this deception that speaks to a weakness that grows beyond within us as well. That's not just about the tools, but also about the search for instant gratification an inability that we're developing to see past surface level where people in general try to recreate themselves and their universe to fit their desires. And they don't think about the long-term consequences. They don't think about ethics. They don't think about what this is going to mean. So then what happens when this Dajjal presents his Jannah and says, here, you can escape. You can enter into this and you'll have everything that you want. And you don't have to wait for anything. Just go ahead and step in. And I think about, and may Allah protect us, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ taught us to seek protection. I think about people and the mindsets of people as they take that step in, right? And what's going through their minds? Is it that they're so convinced that he is indeed God? Is it that what's the worth of this life anyway? You know, somehow I remember watching the, uh, some interviews with those that are uh, going to Mars at this point where, you know, or, or signing themselves up, enlisting themselves, knowing that it's a very risky mission, but I remember one of them saying, you know, if I die, then it's better than being in this world anyway. I thought, wow. He literally listed out the options. Like, that's how he did the math. He said, you know, I either make it to Mars or I die or I stay in this world. And he said, staying in this world is option number three for me. So I, I take option number two anyway over option number one. You got to think about that. Like what world nurtures that, right? Where people try to recreate themselves and recreate their perfect world. And someone that might say, you know what? I don't care, I'll step in anyway. What's the worst that could possibly happen? What's the worst that could possibly happen? And the Prophet wasallam said that he comes with al-Jannah, or not al-Jannah itself, the likeness of paradise, the appearance of a paradise. And he said that his Jannah is actually fire. His paradise is actually fire. And another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he has these two flowing rivers. And there's no contradiction between the two, uh, the two narrations here because the Prophet ﷺ is presenting what he's saying very specifically is that he's got these rivers of lava and burning and fire, right? And he's saying, this is my, this is hellfire. And then he's got these rivers flowing, you know, of musk and of milk, the image of which, and he says, this is my Jannah. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, if one of you sees that, if you get into a situation where you're standing right in front of him and that's what you have to do, the Prophet ﷺ said, lower your gaze, close your eyes, put your head down and drink from the boiling water. And he said, I swear it will be cool water. His Jannah is not and his not is Jannah. It's flipped. SubhanAllah, like, don't be deceived by what's being put out in front of you like that. And people have to ask themselves, you know, what motivations and weaknesses the Dajjal preys upon, that could be within us. And this is what I want to end with. The deception of the Dajjal cannot happen without the deception of dunya and the deception of the devil. Can't. The allure of dunya is one of zina, zina tul hayat dunya right? It has appearances, but we can't see past appearances. People become relegated to the material world. They can't see past it. And the, the promise of the devil is what? that the consequences are not going to be that bad. If you boil down the deception of shaitan, the deception of the devil, is what? That the, the consequences of your deeds you should not think about because it's not going to be that bad, right? The pleasure that you're going to enjoy right now is greater than any possible consequences you might face. That's a mindset, that's a weakness that's exploited and that grows. And so then the final piece of that is simply a presentation of what you want to jump into. And we have to resist 
as the world becomes shallower and our senses become more distorted, falling prey to that type of stuff. And thinking about the long-term consequences and thinking about purpose when it's so easily diluted and thinking about why we exist when it's so easily diluted and thinking about the hereafter when we can't see it and we don't have 3D graphics or, or actors or movies. And, what, thinking about al-Jannah wa thinking about that meeting with Allah, thinking about that meeting with the Prophet thinking about that idea of being held accountable and thinking about that idea of reward and punishment. You've got to see through it all and remind yourself that I can't turn my senses into something that's divine, nor can I put my trust into tools that are becoming ever more deceptive and deceitful. May Allah protect us from all of the fitan that we are surrounded by. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to develop that strong sense of faith and certainty that we see through deception and that allows us to act in that which is pleasing to him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for the best of our deeds and forgive us for our shortcomings. Allahumma ameenum.